I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our guest speakers uh, before we begin this discussion. And may, as just um, uh, mimicking what Karuna said, please identify yourself before you speak um, and make your comments as succinct as possible. We don't have a lot of time. We want as many people as possible to speak. And only ask one question or make one comment at a time. And that'll also give everybody a chance to speak. And in inter we will have an intermission after the first session. Okay, so Peter, um, would you like to begin? And so I, I see that I'm, d I'm down on the... Um I'm down on the schedule here to introduce the forum to what Jeffrey Rubinoff has written about his own work. But um, I'm not going to do that at all. Um, I'm going to do something uh, slightly different. Because you all had the tour yesterday, at least uh, those who come in from uh, UVic and, and, um, and points uh, much further to the uh, east than UVic as well, and others of you who've joined us this morning will have had ample opportunity to see uh, Jeffrey's work in the, um, in the sculpture park here. So that is the work, it's out there. And what I'm concerned with this mo morning is talking about uh, Jeffrey uh, Rubinoff's writings, many of them collected in this uh, uh, new edition of his work, Rubinoff on Art. And what you'll find if you look at this uh, book is that it's not about Jeffrey's own work at all. He has a very clear view that actually the work speaks for itself, that we recover its meaning by responding directly to the work, not by reading about it. That, uh, in a sense... Uh, his, his sculpture hasn't done its own work if it needs a lot of this exegesis and uh, if it needs a lot of, of justification in words. But nonetheless, Geoffrey um, has shown himself a very able and uh, productive uh, writer. His uh, writings are quite extensive and what's collected here um, is are essentially... Um, pieces that he uh, uh, first gave as papers to previous meetings of the forum, going back um, at any rate to um, uh, uh, 2010, when it was called Company uh, of Ideas. And in what he says about art and what motivates him, there's a central significance to the series of aphorisms that he has presented to the forum more than once. When I first came to the forum in, in 2011 with Maria, I heard a paper from Geoffrey which finished with these six aphorisms which we were left to ponder at that time. And then when I came along again in uh, 2012, and Jeffrey spoke, and you can, uh, you can find this actually, those who've, who've got the copies here on, on uh, page 86 of, of the book. Blow me, we had the same six aphorisms presented to us all over again. I've, I've referred to this uh, in, in the past as a, as a possible charge of self-plagiarism against uh, Jeffrey, but I think in the end we can acquit him because of the crucial weight and significance that he gives to these aphorisms. Let me read them out um, for those of you who are not uh, actually looking at the page here. I was born in the shadow of the end game. Secondly, I am an artist. Thirdly, art is an act of will in accordance with a mature conscious. conscience. Fourthly, there can be no resignation. Fifthly, the artist is witness to existence itself. And finally, art is the celebration. Now clearly, he attaches great importance 
to these aphorisms, which are his most elegant and economical way of formulating these ideas. But uh, although they have their, uh, their own beauty uh, in, in this very abbreviated form, I think some of us with more literal minds need to do a bit more digging uh, to see what he's really getting at here. And we need to unpack uh, these aphorisms to find out what he's uh, really on about. Well, the first one, um, born in the shadow of the end game, uh, implying uh, the shadow of nuclear war, which hung over his uh, early years as he was brought up in, in London, Ontario, watching the bombers flying overhead, going through the drills at school and so on. We, 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 we can see that there's um, uh, obvious biographical significance here. And this uh, consciousness of, of nuclear war um, is not just a childhood boyhood memory. It's, it's certainly stayed with him. Uh, secondly, he tells us, I'm an artist, yes, and um, as, as Maria's indicated, um, uh, Jeffrey took this commitment with due professional seriousness and enlisted uh, in various uh, programs in which he acquired the, uh, the, the technical skills as well as the expansion of his uh, aesthetic understanding in order to uh, e e equip himself in this, in this role. And his emergence as, as a sculptor um, has, to, uh, has to recognize this. Then we come to the third aphorism. And this one really is crucial, I think. Art is an act of will in accordance with a mature conscience. And I think this is perhaps the most important statement here, the one that re requires, therefore, most unpacking to, to see what Jeffrey is really on about here. Because what he's saying, I think, is that, and on much of this, I stand open to correction from uh, Jeffrey himself, the, the subject of my remarks. Um, what, what he's saying is that art isn't just a sort of pleasant or pleasure-loving um, activity, that it, it has some more fundamental and serious purpose purpose and that the artist in executing his or her work um, should be fulfilling this. And in particular, what Jeffrey means, and this is on page 87, uh, which, which, which follows his presentation of these aphorisms, he, he specifies that the artist must be concerned with what he calls the existential realities of the artist's time. And what are these? Well, the first one is nuclear deterrence and this shadow of the end game, the awareness of the fate of the world hanging uh, in, in this way. Um, I won't say more about that. The second one is transgenic engineering, with which he's become increasingly concerned in uh, recent years. And it's important to understand here, I think, that he doesn't mean by this that he has any hostility or, or even scepticism towards uh, genetic uh, research or towards the kind of individual modification that might help in, in medical um, extremities and, and so on. Uh, that what he is concerned with is, is transgenic um, transgenic engineering of a kind which would transform the whole uh, evolutionary uh, basis of, of our species and, and of uh, other species that uh, in, inhabit the world here. And then he puts up um, a third possible candidate uh, for the um, existential realities of our time, global warming. Now, we might think this was a very obvious um, uh, issue on which someone with a mature conscience ought to be intervening, ought to be concerned. In the end, he, he dismisses it from his list on grounds that we could argue about, but I won't go into... Peter, uh, you're running on. over your time. Thank you. Right. Um, 
Oh, I thought we had more time, though, because you, you've, been, you've been so uh, admirably brief hitherto. Anyway, I'll, 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 I'll try to abbreviate my remarks. Um, uh, global warming, I think he, in the end, regards as a problem which, if it doesn't solve itself, then has the means of, of, of solving it without the sort of intervention uh, that, that he's otherwise talking about. So the third existential reality that he's talking about is actually art itself. He means that there is a very specific and indeed um, um, a crucial duty of, 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 of the artist not to act in accordance with the conscience in order to engage in propaganda or to... Um, use prominence as an artist to gain our, our attention through other words, through print media or, or through other verbal formulations, but to produce art itself. Because, as he says at another po point, art is self-contained truth. And hence, I think, we can pass rather quickly over aphorisms four, five, and six. There can be no resignation. The artist is witness to existence itself Art is the celebration, which all seem to me to be variations on that important theme. And so I come to my final points. Do we conclude from this that art is superior to science? No, but it is different. And page 64 is the reference for those of you who might want to follow up this point, because as he puts it there, science is truth by analogy, art is truth by metaphor. Now, analogy and metaphor are terms that we sometimes use in a rather sloppy way as though they meant the same thing, but I think the difference is perhaps this, that analogy can be expanded. You can argue by analogy, and if someone doesn't get it at first, you, 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 you can explain exactly what you mean by the analogy, and you can uh, proceed in, in that way, whereas metaphor makes an immediate impact. It either works or, or, or it doesn't work, but it, it works on the spot. It, it, is, it is absolutely there. And this, he is suggesting, is the methodological distinction between art and science here. Now, two points follow from this. First of all, that art is older than science on this reading. Okay, we can talk about the origins of science and mathematics and all the rest of it with the ancient Greeks and the ancient Egyptians. They laid the foundations, no doubt. But art can be found in the caves of Chauvet, in particular, 35,000 years ago much longer ago than that, on a hugely different time perspective. And hence the significance for Geoffrey of what he calls the age of agriculture, uh, which I must admit puzzled me for, for some time uh, in my early days at these forums. Well, what, what he means by this is the uh, widespread significance of the move in history towards the protection of crops in an arable way by warriors. In order to, if you were going to grow crops, you had to protect them, hence the need for warriors to do this. So does he agree that war is part of the human condition? No, he would disagree with philosophers like Thomas Hobbes, who tells us that the war of every man against every man is absolutely endemic inside ourselves. What is missing in the caves of Chauvet, Geoffrey tells us, is any depiction of warfare. So, art is certainly older than science here. Art is also older than war itself. Because, if he's right in this interpretation of Chauvet and what it, it, um, uh, these early uh, examples of, of cave art are, are, are showing us, Art is more fundamental. Before the age of agriculture, before the need for warriors, there were, there were still artists. The artist precedes the warrior here. And hence, I think, the, as I would argue, the need uh, for Geoffrey to write about the general status of art rather than to write about his own particular work. Or at least... That's how I understand it, and of course, 
I'll be very interested to have further responses later, not least from Geoffrey himself. Linda. Thank you. Well, picking up from what Peter was talking about, I want to open up uh, for discussion three key issues related to artists' writings. And these are the relationship of artists' words to their artworks, which we've been hearing about, the value of artists' writings for art history, and the way in which artists write. Again, something Peter discussed. Can we identify a distinctive style or set of concerns? The first thing to say is that it's very common for visual artists to write, and has been throughout history. But it's perhaps just as common for artists to express some reservations about this writing and about how it might relate to their practice. It might be helpful to begin with Jeffrey Rubinoff's own thoughts on this topic, as he's expressed in the collected writings. He describes his statements as insights that evolved with and from the sculpture. And he also explains that the insights are realized as ideas in the sculptures. I found this a very interesting way of putting it. And I take this to mean that his ideas did not precede the work in the sense of providing some kind of program for it, and nor do they explain it retrospectively. His ideas find expression in the works initially, which may then themselves suggest other ways of formulating these ideas verbally. His emphasis on the independence of the work of art from a priori ideas, as well as from art critical or art historical interpretations, has a long history. In the period that I've specialised in, which has been the later 19th century, two factors brought this issue to a crisis point, I think. The rise of the critic, the increasing power of the writer over the reputations and livelihoods of artists, and especially perhaps in painting, the move away from narrative, that is, from an expectation that literature supply the themes for painting. So as visual artists were finding a new level of independence in their means of expression, at the same time, writers claimed that they held the key to interpretation. That's critics, poets, and novelists. This sense of rivalry may explain why artists have written in order to speak back about their work to prevent misinterpretations. So to, a couple of quotes as examples. Whistler, in his famous 10 o'clock lecture of 1885, denounced the critic as a middleman whose literary explanations distort the painter's poetry of colour and forms. And Gauguin, uh, Paul Gauguin, in 1902, wrote a piece of what he called counter-criticism, called Dauber's Gossip, in order to prove that under no circumstances do painters need the support or instruction of literary men. But this may also explain why artists seem hesitant about the writing that they do, because they want to assert their distance, perhaps, from these professional writers. Again, a couple of examples of what artists have said on this front, and this is all from artists who, who have written. The French painter... Thomas Couture, from the 19th century, said, what I am writing is not literature. Gauguin, I am not a writer. Ad Reinhardt, I never say anything about my paintings. Mel Bochner, the idea of being a writer was the furthest thing from my mind. But artist writing, of course, is not just defensive. It can also offer insights or be a creative form of expression in its own right. Despite the reservations that artists seem to have concerning verbal expression, their writings have played an undeniable role in the shaping of art history. Jeffrey Rubinoff speaks of an artist's history as opposed to art history, and a history of art by artists. And he admits to being much more receptive to art history when it's written by historians who were, or at least wanted to be, artists. <laughs> he rightly <coughs> points to, to the significance of Giorgio Vasari's lives of the most eminent painters, sculptors, and architects of 1550, which is widely considered one of the foundational texts of art history written by a painter. A century earlier, the memoirs of the Florentine sculptor Lorenzo Ghiberti or the painter Cennino Cennini's Craftsman's Handbook are also key moments in the history of Western art writing, and there are other examples. So artists have always written, 
But since the 20th century, arguably, there's been a veritable explosion of their manifestos, memoirs, and criticism. And Rubinoff has particular praise for Kandinsky's Concerning the Spiritual in Art of 1911. There are so many other examples, far too many to mention, although perhaps people will have ideas of ones that they consider important. But I did want to mention two book series that indicate how seriously artists' writings are taken as contributions to art theory. One is the Documents of Modern Art series, which was edited by the abstract expressionist painter Robert Motherwell, beginning in 1944. And the other is the MIT Press's Writing Art series, begun in 1991 and continuing now, which consists of editions of the writings of 20th century, mostly post-war artists. The rubric for this latter series, I think, is quite helpful in thinking through how we might interpret artists' words. So I'll just quote this to you. Writings by artists convey a specific type of knowledge or way of thinking about artistic practice that the writings of academic and professional observers do not. It's not just a matter of artist texts filling discursive gaps between critical writing and artistic production. It's also a question of texts by artists creating intellectual, political and cultural possibilities that would not otherwise exist. So this suggests that artists' writings have an interest in their own right, in part because they're able to make connections between ideas and practice. And this, I think, this connection between ideas and practice, which is unique to artists who write, might be something that unites what otherwise seems to be an extraordinarily diverse field with problematic borderlines. After all, this category of artist writings could include statements, manifestos, interviews, art theory or criticism, manuals or treatises, but it might also include correspondence, diaries, autobiography, artist books, text-based artwork, or even poetry or fiction. So in thinking about this category, should we distinguish between public and private writing, between artists writing or um, artwork that consists of text it's often very difficult to draw the lines here is a poem or a novel still artist writing or is it a work of literature that just happens to be by an artist I want to end just by suggesting one feature that seems common to many artists writings and that was mentioned by Peter and that is a tendency towards aphorism directness brevity of statement the use of epigrams and so on. So Georges Braque's Thoughts and Reflections on Painting of 1917 is one famous example, and they consist of pithy statements such as the painter thinks in terms of form and colour, or new means, new subjects. Geoffrey's statement on Donatello, the surprising power and overwhelming presence of Donatello's Magdalene simply is seems to me to fit into this tradition. The statement itself has an arresting quality and a frankness that accord with the qualities of the sculpture without offering a detailed description of it. It seems logical that artists who have something to say but who are resistant to the notion that words can explain the visual would lean towards modes of writing that are less discursive. And in the work that I've been doing recently, which is on the writings of the French symbolist painter Paul Gauguin, I found um, an extraordinary creativity in writing that deliberately resists the conventions of standard prose, such as analysis, description, narrative development, and instead uses techniques like assemblage of voices, pseudonyms, anecdote and aphorisms, quotation and poetry. And this is writing that tells us something about his practice as an artist, but is not criticism and it's not art history, it's its own category artists writing. So I'd be very interested to hear what, what Jeffrey has to say about that. Thank you very much, Linda. So we've heard two very interesting um, discussions, presentations. And uh, Jeffrey, would you like to comment? And then we'll <coughs> open up the floor. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it relatively simple. I guess I should move this over here. That's OK. Um, It's how uh, the writing evolved for this particular work from a, an odd place. It was that 
the ideas were flowing from the work. I couldn't really call them ideas because they hadn't been hashed out by anyone publicly. So they were self-contained within the work, which I, I said to Peter, uh, the work is its argument of art history itself. If it can't hold its own on its argument, then it's not worth doing. So what happened was, and a, and a big surprise to me, was that the work could actually evolve ideas and not the other way around. It was the concept, even having made so much work before, even starting this 1980 series, um, that the work was, a reflective, was reflective of the culture it lived in, not itself capable of actually generating ideas. And that's the part that really surprised me. Uh, one of the most important ideas here, which is art is an act of will in accord with the mature conscience. Um, firstly, it grew from a, a statement made by Simone de Beauvoir when I was 19, which I've written about. But the most important aspect of that was I was looking for a way for artists themselves to measure their own work. And that meant this was an artist-to-artist -artist statement as it began. And that is two parts. The first part is, has the art entered the work before the artist even begins it? And has he accomplished his obligation to art to have finished the work? In other words, the art still resides in the work when he's finished with it. I'd seen too many pieces where that hadn't happened. And, uh, and that's at any time in, in art history, where the art doesn't bother to enter the, the work. The artist still manages to finish the work, often hating it all the way through, leaves it there and leaves it to history, and the artist is often the only one who knows whether the art entered the work and knows whether or not he fulfilled his obligation. So that was the concept of an act of will in accord with the mature conscience. It does expand outward, and so it expands from art out into the world itself, as Simone de Beauvoir did as, as she had the concept of individual conscience being an act of an existential act. So um, that's part of it. This was not meant, this was not meant for publication in its, its first time. Uh, when uh, I had the um, ability to create these entities, these, there's the Jeffrey Rubinoff Foundation and the Jeffrey Rubinoff uh, Sculpture Park in, in uh, 2004, uh, we were debating as to how the park would interface with the island and interface with the world. And my daughter, Liba, suggested that all of these ideas, which she had heard from the time from her crib practically, uh, ad nauseum, and had ignored for 30 years, had started to register with her friends and started to have some meaning. So she suggested that we do, in, in the architecture and what we're doing here, is, is create a forum building, a building where we can hold forums such as what we're having now. So uh, originally it was just to be a little public building and maybe interface with the, the Hornby Island Festival Society. So our first, uh, so, the building is obviously designed to hold a limited, intimate group of people, and, and for music as well. So she suggested that Karun uh, might be the person to organize these. And so Karun came, and I took him on a tour of the work. It was in November, before we did any planning for the building. And uh, <coughs> over the time of looking at the work, how and what some of the ideas about the work came in, in part of that tour. And he suggested that these would be of, of real value to his generation. And that was the thing that kicked it over. So he, he sat me down for three days and transcribed these verbal ideas. Really, I just called them insights because they hadn't been publicly hashed out or kicked around at all. And, uh, and so he transcribed them. And those became... The basis for the forums, because they started with the insights, and the direction at that point was towards 
his generation, my daughter's generation, they were the 30 year olds. Um, our first forum seemed to be really over the head of, of, of most of their friends, and their friends were very diverse and very well educated. But the ideas just had, they hadn't heard them before, and that was one of the things that, that I, I've since learned that there are people who welcome, to, welcome ideas that they've never heard before, and there are people who to turn their back on them because they've never heard them before. So it's, there's a split. Um, they just were sort of nonplussed by the whole idea of it. So we, we graduated year by year in the forum area in, into these other areas, and finally I felt like I had to start giving some papers on the thing to be able to expand what it was to an actual forum group. And so that's how this came about. It, it otherwise remained just a, simply a private part of what I understood about art. And the idea of actually uh, writing papers or publishing it or doing anything grew out of this forum, actually. It, it grew out of the idea of the forum. So that's how that came about. So it's almost accidental in that way. We could have gone a different direction altogether. It just happens that we went in this particular direction. And I, it's been very exciting because it's, there's, we were always able to find a group of people to whom these things can go back and forth. And that, to me, brings these ideas into, into life from insights. They went from insights into uh, uh, a kind of lifehood by having done it. So having done the papers was to go all the way back to really my undergraduate and graduate times. You know, it was going back a long time for me. <laughs> but um, it's proven to be quite fruitful. So this is, this is one of the reasons why it even exists. There was really no great reason for it. I really do hold that the work itself has to stand as its own argument in art history. If it doesn't, then... You, you haven't done your job, so you can't really rationalize it in terms of the, its historical significance. But the sideline to this was is that this the, is this surprise that the work itself can actually produce ideas. And so we have been working on, and, and we've named our forums in the past, Art as a Source of Knowledge, where actually original perspectives, it's not so much that the ideas themselves are... Are, are, what makes them significant as they come out is that the artist's perspective, especially on history, is very different than other people's perspectives, just as an original work of art gives an original perspective on either sculpture or painting or whatever, or poetry, it doesn't really matter. As it changes perspective, then that's what the artist has to offer in terms of ideas, is a perspective that hasn't been presented before. For those who turn their back on things they've never heard before, then the artist is just talking into air. But uh, for people who are interested in things they've never heard before and, and another way of looking at things, another way of perceiving things, then the artist's work becomes valuable. So this is, this is, that's about all I have to say on that. <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey. Thank you for the three speakers. Um, I think now we could um, open up We've got lots of ideas to discuss here um, and address the remarks of the three speakers. And uh, who would like to go first? Do I see any hands? Yes, Marcus. Uh, hello, uh, Marcus Millwright. I'm uh, art history at uh, University of Victoria. I just want to pick up on uh, some of the things that Linda was talking about because there's this sort of underlying sort of antagonism between you know, artists writing against you know, critics and art historians in this sense that art historians are simply trying to explain things and, and of course there's this problem between you know words and images and it, it took me to thinking about Michael Baxendall and the way in which you know he talks about what we do when we write about paintings but I think the other thing is that I wondered if it sets up a kind of false dichotomy because the thing is that what art history does or it can be doing different things. I mean, it can potentially be exploring the intentionality of an artist. And there, of course, where there's a living artist who is writing about their work, you know, there's a, you've got to be offering something fairly compelling to 
suggest that an artist is not correct about their own point of view, although I think that that is potentially something one can do. But I think an art historian is also looking at the artwork once it enters the world, because the thing is that it's about the the art as it interacts with its different audiences, as it interacts within the spaces, as it, certainly in, if one looks at kind of pre-modern contexts, it performs ritual functions or something like that. And so in that sense, I think that, you know, we, we don't want to kind of suggest that there's art history over here and then there's artists writing on the other side. It's not, uh, to me at least, a, a, a conflict in that sense. Very good. Very uh, insightful. Um, does anyone want to build on that or raise any other point? I'd like to raise an historical point, and we'll go right back to the word impressionist. It was meant as a pejorative when it was done by other writers and laid across that work. They were actually just independent artists making an independent statement. And in a way, what it did in terms of modern art history, in, in my opinion, the writers themselves created these pejorative statements that became categories that were actually incorporated in art history so that we can use the word impressionist now and it actually has an art historical sense. But I feel badly for the artists at the time because it really was a put down. And the same thing went with Cubism. That they, they didn't call themselves Cubists. <laughs> they never thought of themselves as Cubists. That was also meant as a put down. So, so it's very interesting to watch how the critics have been able to, to make these criticisms of, of artists as they've made independent statements and uh, their, their own independent statements and then given them a category that begins as a pejorative that actually is incorporated in art history itself. I, just, I, I think that that needs to be mentioned as you, as you talk about how that goes but it's the aspect that it's pejorative rather than being positive in and of itself. Yeah. That's the part that's been incorporated. That's the part that I find most interesting. Yeah. Mm. interesting. Yes, there's a, there's a wonderful book called, it was published oh, 20 years ago, many of you may know of it, called The Shock of the New, which actually deals with this phenomenon. Anyone else? Linda, you respond. Just to respond to, to what Marcus said, yes, I, I think that's, that's right. I wouldn't want to suggest a complete split between art history and artist writings. I suppose I was just trying to think about how we might think of artist writings as a category in a sense it does have its own interest to me, this category of writing, so that it doesn't completely um, filter into these other ex pre-existing categories such as art history or literature or criticism. Um, but, you know, th those borders of course are porous, but there seemed to me something interesting about what happens when an artist writes who is engaged in practice but then also um, is writing down those ideas. Uh, as I mentioned, lots of artists have contributed to art history in sort of direct ways of writing major art historical texts, so there certainly is, is crossover. Um, but perhaps when, when we write as art historians or critics, we we are writing from a different position. We're not writing from a position of having to think about how to, how to explain or how to speak about what we are doing in our own art. So it, there, there's something specific about the, the genre, yes. I think. Mm. Peter, did you want... Oh, I'm sorry. And yes. then Paul. I, I, I find this very interesting. I, I speak as, as his historian. I, I'm reminded of the... Um, the the uh, um, debates that a lot of historians and philosophers had 30, 40 years about 30 or 40 years ago about meaning and intention and how far one privileges any text by the meaning that it had for the person that created it as against uh, and, and therefore the, the intention governed what its 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 meaning would would be that there's an obvious parallel, isn't there, to the sort of issues that you're raising here. So um, can one say that two e extreme positions might be to say that only an artist knows what the meaning of 
his or her own work is. Or you might say that the meaning of, of the work um, is something that the, the artist might even not consciously recognize. I'm, I'm not sure I, I would um, adopt either position, but uh, it seems to me that, um, uh, uh, that they're both uh, perspectives on the, on the same problem there. Paul. Hi there. Uh, Paul Walt. I'm a, a, in the studio program at, uh, well, I teach in the, the studio program at uh, University of Victoria and uh, the chair of the department. Um, I just want to uh, make a brief comment about, uh, I think there's a difference between a critic and an art historian. And, and I think those are different roles. And, uh, you know, I think, Jeffrey, you're responding to the critic. Uh, no, and no, I was responding to the concept the critic makes the first statement the critic art history yeah adopts art, that art history, as a yes. category and then that, they, that are, was, and they are different yeah, yeah yeah um and how it and how it does that that process of art history taking that category which began as a pejorative from a critic right yes and then it becomes an actually it becomes an adopted. active category yeah. yeah an active category within art history so there's uh, the institutionalization of of those categories mm -hmm. Yeah. through criticism yeah and then adopted by the art historians themselves so the distance between the, the intent of the artist becomes a lot greater once you separate it that way if what happens as does happen in the 19th century right. that the that the the critics themselves become uh, uh, part of art history they become part of the the initiation of this terminology that conversation really needs to be had. I haven't heard it. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to uh, add to the, the other thing about privileging the, art, the artist's voice. Um, uh, one of the things we do in teaching studio classes is we have critique, of course. And uh, in the critique process, uh, there's different ways of organizing critiques. And, and some critiques, uh, the student speaks first about the work. Uh, I tend to organize my critiques uh, the other way around in which I ask the class to go first because I find that if the professor, uh, which in that case is acting in the role of the, the critic, uh, or the, the student who's the, the artist, if they speak first, their viewpoint is privileged um, to the point where the other students can't respond to the work uh, mm -hmm. and uh, express their own, their own opinions. And uh, so when the students are allowed to speak first, quite often they, they do get to the heart of the matter and they do uh, uncode, decode the work. And, um, and that way the, the student whose work it is, the artist uh, in that case, uh, has an opportunity to see how the work is communicating on its own. And, uh, you know, I think it's important for the work to speak for, on, on its own. Uh, and... Uh, what I appreciated about your tour yesterday, Jeffrey, is that, that you didn't explain the work. Uh, you explained work, you provided context for it, but didn't explain it. And, uh, I, and uh, I think there's, uh, uh, in most artists' writings, there, there's a tendency to not to try to explain the work for those purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's uh, quite often with the students, there is a tendency to want to make sure that everyone knows what they're talking about. Um, yeah, so. Interesting. Thanks, Paul. Uh, uh, Karun. Yeah, I, I just I wanted to ask uh, Linda what you think the uh, writings of, say, someone like Gauguin, what they add to the viewer's understanding of his work if, if they're completely on a different track and should be viewed as their own category of writing and, and perhaps not even a part of the work at all, or if there is anything that can be uh, added by knowing more about those writings. And, and, and obviously by you know, any artist, not just Gauguin, but you know, you've studied this. Uh, yes, well I think picking up on, on what's just been said, Gauguin's writings don't explain his paintings. In fact, they kind of work to do the opposite. They actually, if you read them, they may appear, at least initially, to be describing what's happening in a given work, usually a painting he writes about. 
Uh, but then if you actually look at the words and, and then you look at the painting, you find that it actually just becomes more complicated rather than in any way explaining what's happening in the picture. And that seems to me deliberate and a way of, um, a, as he himself explains in other writings, it's a, it's a way of preserving some kind of independence for the work from the way in which it might be interpreted by critics. So it's a way both to excite interest in the painting, um, but to prevent there being a sense of it being easily translatable into words. So I think he's actually using writing to further protect the image from words, which sounds paradoxical, but that's what I think he's doing. But in his case, anyway, I also see his writing as part of his practice, which is quite multimedia. So his paintings have words in, his sculptures sometimes have words in too, and uh, his writings have images in, and I think actually he's very interested in that crossover between the media. But that may be particular to what, to what he's doing. Um. Yes, I, Linda, I liked your comment about getting into the work through the writing. Certainly studying Emily Carr, who wrote voraciously, um, she often wrote about a painting before she, you know, when, and usually it was just the feelings of, you know, how she felt uh, the process, uh, which was usually spiritual with her. But um, it, it certainly did give one an insight. It didn't describe how she did it, but yeah. one gave, certainly gave me an insight to what was going on. Mm-hmm. Anyone else? What about one of the students? Yeah. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, Alan, were you next? Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm Alan Adliff. I'm an art historian at the uh, University of Victoria. Um, Jeffrey, a- apropos the critic um, and the art historian and the interrelationship between the two, um, I've written as a critic and also as an art historian, and I, I enjoy moving from, from one mode to another. Um, I think there's uh, you know, something that breaks out of the either-or kind of paradigms is the recognition of the plurality within us. And you have that plurality as an artist and a writer, right? Um, It's something that relates to um, what you're saying about cubism. Uh, I, of course, thought about the cubists embracing the term cubism, which they did at the time. Albert Glaze, Jean Messonnier, published a book called On Cubism. So they, they take that pejorative and they invert it into a positive. Um, so there's also, there are also interesting dialogues that emerge um, from the expansion of reception, which I think our criticism and our history is all about. So in that sense, I, I think of myself as contributing to the understanding of art, not getting in the way of it. Does anyone, what? Jeffrey, do you want to respond yeah. to that? <laughs> um, it, it's a very old technique, of course, across many disciplines to, uh, for groups to pick up an initially hostile pejorative description of themselves, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That you think of the um, First World War. I might think of the First World War, where the Kaiser was reported to have referred to Britain's contemptible little army, mm-hmm. whereupon... The, the veterans call themselves the old contemptibles. Um, in the uh, South African War, which took place at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, uh, those who opposed the war in Britain were called by their opponents pro-Boers, uh, and they, they took the description up themselves. And one, one can think of many other examples where, you know, that, that te- technique if it is a technique or, or that, uh, that ploy is, is, is being adopted. And uh, I, think, I think the term Methodist was originally pejorative in that way in the 18th century. But Jeffrey, you can address the art. What interests me is the process that moves from, uh, which is contained in what you're saying, and which is contained in what Peter says, that moves from, uh, especially in the, in the late 19th century and into the 20th century, on how art history moves in a, in a, in a direction and, and, and with that interconnection with criticism into commodifying art. And that's the part that concerns me, is how uh, 
that process loans itself to the commodification. That doesn't necessarily mean that the Cubists didn't want to be commodified. They may very well have wanted to be commodified, and therefore it's a, a very good way to put it around. Hey, this increases sales. As long as you spell my name right, that's the only real <laughs> issue here. But I'm concerned about the commodification because of where the commodification led to, and it seems to me that it's at that juncture, especially with the concept of the Impressionists, that we were on our way to commodifying a new market for art and a different market for art that had, had been there before and with different purposes and an independent market for art as well. So it's a, it's a very interesting aspect of this, uh, which I'm sure we're going to get into a little bit later as well, on how this commodification came about and how complete it became within a hundred years. And so I think about the artist making an independent statement in, what, 1874? I think that was when the, the first independent show was. Was it 1874 or 1876? I think it was 1874. Uh, I think about them making an independent statement then, and then, and there were the artists themselves making a statement about their own work in relationship to the world. and. By the 1980s, I think I counted the artists about number six in that list down the line as to their importance about their own work. You know, they followed, uh, depending on the year and the time, by the 1980s, it was the major collectors, major collectors who had the say into what would be art, the, the Demonils, the Satchis, uh, even, even, even Lou Manilow. Uh, in Chicago. So the artists went down, 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 down in, in the order of importance, beginning with this larger commodification. Now, the commodification, I, I'd like to hear that because I think it's a very important part of art history. And, and the art historians themselves becoming part of that categorization that leads to the depths of that commodification. So I don't know if you have a comment on that or not. Alan, do you have a comment? I'd like to. Sure, yeah. yes, yeah. Um, I write extensively about artists' resistance to commodification. And I'm interested in that historically and also in the present. Uh, my own role as an art historian is not to further the commodification of art. I occupy a space of dissonance in relation to that process. As an activist and as a human being, I'm not pro-capitalist. So, so I'm, I'm interested in the, and something I've had the opportunity to do since I adopted this art historical hat, which is not the first one I've, I've put on my head. Uh, there's been other things I've done in life. Um, has to do with uh, resuscitating this, this counter history to the narrative that you just related. Mm -hmm. When I think about anti-commodification in relation to the neo-impressionists, for example, I think of their deep engagement in the anarchist movement, the contributions they made as illustrators to anarchist publications, the ways in which they would it, conduct mutual aid amongst themselves to support themselves in hard times, mm -hmm. and all these avenues to pursue a set of values that are quite different from the ones you're talking about. Yeah, so what you're saying is, is that uh, with a certain amount of clarity, you can actually come down on one side or the other of this. You've come down on the side of the, the angels, obviously. Actually, I, I guess what, what I'm trying to clarify is that there are many, we're all multi-layered human beings. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that I'm outside of the parameters of Global warming, for example, <laughs> to make an obvious, uh, an obvious mm -hmm. instance of something that's affecting us all, despite our intentions, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's, you know, I am a multi-layered human being. Mm -hmm. I think we all are. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we can keep, be captured within a system called capitalism, and we have choices within that system in terms of how we work against it, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does someone else uh, want to build Brad? Brad Bewey. Topic a little bit. You, uh, Brad, you, um, you quoted or you mentioned Simone de Beauvoir as an inspiration for your comment about the mature conscience and just a comment about her work because she was a philosopher, she was an autobiographer, and she was an artist, she was a novelist. And she felt the need to 
make an ethics of Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy. And I actually see a parallel with you. I don't see a so much about work out here, but it is, it, I think it's an ethics. It's very much about morality. Now, you could read the Simone de Beauvoir novel, know nothing about existentialism or her ethics. So I'm just wondering if you'd comment on that. Do you see that parallel? Although she's, a, she's her medium is writing and her philosophy is writing, so there's that. Yeah, indeed, I do see that, that relationship. Uh, the ethics of ambiguity is basically what I'm referring to. Uh, yeah. Uh, but in 1965, when I was 19, she was in the United States uh, promoting her, I think, her second autobiography. So uh, she, the article, very specifically, where she, she speaks about this, Aspect, which is beyond, actually beyond the ethics of ambiguity. Although the ethics of ambiguity contains this, you have to really read into it. But she was very, very explicit, and that was she differentiated between morality and conscience in such a way. And the way that she spelled it out was this: was that uh, the transports from Paris to Auschwitz were done with a complete access, uh, uh, a complete um, from start to finish, it, it was completed by very ordinary people doing what, and and in the consider in their own consideration, in their own consideration considered themselves extremely moral. And as she pointed out in this particular article, they went to church every Sunday, they saw themselves as particularly moral. So therefore, the issue that she was trying to make and the statement that she was trying to make was that existence itself was based on individual acts of conscience, not acts of individual, sorry, acts of individual conscience, not individual acts of conscience. So there's a difference between the two. It's the acts of individual conscience. And that's what stuck with me from that. But that is from that is an extrapolation, her own extrapolation from the ethics of ambiguity. And so uh, I haven't been able to find the article. I think it was either written in the New York Review of Books or in the, uh, even the New York Times Magazine at the time. But she was in the United States promoting promoting that that second autobiography. Uh, Yes, I, I saw that as her speaking as an artist at that particular point, and I thought that that was particularly important to me, and that 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 statement itself was the, the critical one. Sorry, go ahead. Jennifer wanted to speak a while ago, and uh, please go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, I hope I'm not diverting the conversation because I'm returning to an earlier point. But uh, Jennifer Wise, I teach theater history at University of Victoria. Uh, it's a question for Linda, and I see um, that, uh, I'm sorry I haven't read it yet, I look forward to reading your book about artists as writers, that's what you've been speaking about, and you say this is a special category that maybe has its own pressures and conventions, and while you were speaking I was reminded very, with a lot of affection of a book my mother gave me when I was a young woman, very confused about what I wanted to do when I grew up, and it was called The Writer as Visual Artist. Are you familiar with that book? It's wonderful. And it takes, it's the same subject, but from completely the other point of view. For some reason today, I can only remember Victor Hugo as one of the artists. But I was amazed. The, the book was a revelation to me, because these are people, all of whom I knew as writers, but not as visual artists. And they turned out all, everyone, to a man and woman, to be magnificent artists. And I wonder, did you think about that? Have you looked at that? Is that a completely different category of someone who is fundamentally a writer and then is a, but also is an artist? Or maybe I look at myself and I think, why did I become more of a writer than an artist even though I'm also a visual artist? Well, it was because it's cheaper to write than be a visual artist. It's a very expensive way to make art. And so maybe... There's a third category, which is maybe what Jeffrey's talking about when he's speaking about the artist, which is the artist. And whether we use words or uh, images or sounds, maybe it's immaterial in the end. 
That's my question to you. Thanks. It's such an interesting question, and I think part of the difficulty, in a sense, with the category of artist writings is it does start from a point in which the assumption is this is a visual artist who usually does or is known for producing visual art who's now doing words. And, of course, you could twist it around. So if you take Victor Hugo, um, is he an artist writer when he's writing his novels? Uh, no, ten generally we tend to think that he's a novelist who can also do painting. Um, so I think that there's an assumption that there's a way in which people are institutionalized via reputation and so on in terms of where we categorize them as artists that has to come into play here. And there are very few figures who are equally known as both. William Blake would be one, Michelangelo. There aren't very many, but they, they do exist. Um, so I'm bearing that in mind that when I'm talking about artist writings, I'm thinking particularly about the kinds of pressures that artists seem to feel about this relationship to words. Because it could vary from an artist who writes a lot uh, to an artist who doesn't necessarily write a lot, but particularly in, in the current climate feels compelled, perhaps because of the way in which art education encourages the writing of statements and so on to write. So I want to sort of think about that relationship in a, in a longer history. Um, but your point does, if I could turn it to Jeffrey, I did want to ask Jeffrey because you presented this very organic way in which the writing had, or the, the insights had emerged from the work. But you also referred to the fact that you considered being a writer or thought that you would initially be a writer. Yes. So is what then, to sort of turn Jennifer's um, trajectory around, what is it? Mm. that made you go that way yeah. instead. <laughs> yeah, well, if, if, yeah. I can, if I can just butt in, uh, as Jeffrey's biographer, I suppose, it was during the first year at university as an undergraduate that he didn't know if he'd be a writer or a visual artist. Uh, that I have to speak to a certain prejudice in Canada. <laughs> there were no... Uh, art just was not in universities here. It was considered kind of, well, back to the old Beaux-Arts, idea that, you know, you really don't have it for university. Why, why don't you go and make something over here? And so it, it, art in Canada just had no value whatsoever, no value of where I was born and raised, no value in my family, really. And so, um, but writing did. Writing had respect in Canada, so it, it, had, it had an aspect to it. Uh, that seemed to work out, and I could write. But when we think about writing, really, especially creative writing, you both hear and see. So you you're obviously have something both oral and, and visual already incorporated within the work. So that's, you know, I, I don't read without seeing, and I don't read without hearing. So you hear what you said. It's this kind of a magical aspect of this, and it's the magical aspect that you can abstract out, and yes, it is, a lot easier to do. <laughs> the other arguments are significantly, significantly more difficult. And so, and uh, for some reason or another, I got involved with the difficult side of it. <laughs> Does someone else want to build on that or introduce a new theme? Uh, I would find going back to those days of writing first. The first larger pieces of writing that I did, I, I really remember this was much before I knew much about Jeffrey's work or involved in it. And um, from the perspective of where I was coming from, which was an educational perspective, I was always trying to make things more clear and things more, uh, I guess, plain. And, and I kept on feeling like I wanted to make them more mysterious. Now I realize that the ideas were were a lot more complicated, and um, the history that you needed to uh, unpack in them was a lot deeper than I was aware of. But at the time, I remember just the writing process because we were going back and forth on the writing, and then we'd we'd involved somebody to help us edit and review them. It was so fascinating. 
because I, I'd never come across that kind of writing before. It just seemed to be so dense and so, so concentrated. And, you know, it was, it was just really interesting. And I, I felt like um, he was, we were just shaping these little bits. Uh, and, we, you know, it was mostly me trying to figure out, what, what are you trying to say here? And, you no, know, no, this has to be like this. So then we would have a conversation about why we were using this exact, you know, term and going to the dictionary and really, you know, so it was kind of a shaping process. Um, it was it was it was quite interesting and in, and in how different that was to I just thought I would mention just how different that really was to any other kind of writing I had seen before, and then when we presented them, I realized how much greater an impact that had. The kind of writing that I was used to doing wasn't really about the actual form of the words and and the poetry of them and the you know that aspect it was it was really the content and there were the containers for content and it didn't matter really the form of them but I realized it was such a sculptural sort of form of the writing and um, so I, I don't know if if there's when, when we were talking about whether there's a, a, a painter who's also a writer or a musician who's a writer I, I, I tend to and I've said this before I tend to, to uh, look at the artist as someone who's who's perceiving something wants to communicate that the, the medium is all, is almost the consciousness that you have as as a as the artist and the consciousness that you have as the receiver and there's different pathways that you can use and the personality of the artist and that unique perspective gets expressed either through writing or whatever medium they're able to to master or they're able to use i'm just wondering if somebody has a comment on whether that might be a perspective to look at whether it's not necessarily the physical Piece, but it's actually what it is that is happening internally in the artist that they're trying to um, share. Uh, that's actually the art, and and of course you have those pathways and the the physical objects as well. I think Marcus might like to answer that. Well, I don't know if I have an answer, but uh, I mean, it struck me that also thinking about artists and writing or whether they're expressing it in words is that it also exists in relation to the artistic process because the thing is that one has I think at the beginning of a, of a project and I'm, I'm speaking I, I, I did actually do a studio art degree as my first degree uh, so I mean, I'm not claiming to be an artist because it's not something I've done as a, uh, as a living but the thing is that it starts with a certain sort of intention it then works its way through the process of making something at various points at which you stand back and look at it, it develops, and then, of course, it finishes. Um, and it struck me that, you know, when we went on your sculpture tour, you know, we're, we're seeing you talking about, you know, the, the several series of um, pieces that have been done over a series of decades. And what we're hearing is both your recollections of a process as it occurred and then also mostly the sort of culmination of your thinking about it now that they're all there. And so the thing is that when one is evaluating the writing, one would need to kind of locate it very clearly in terms of the actual process of making because I think that the initial intention is always going to be at a certain level of distance from the perceptions that you have at the end of making an individual piece or making a series of pieces. Yes? So, Charo. Um, I think I wanted to contribute something from the uh, perspective of the role of the curator, which is a bit a different from, I think, what we've been talking about so far, but maybe um, exists somewhere between the critic and the art historian. Um, so for as um, a curator of a public art institution I write a lot of texts that interpret the artist's work and um, I've worked in artist-run centers and also commercial galleries where we don't do that as much but in my role now at a public art institution that acts kind of like a, a museum um, I do a lot of uh, uh, extended label texts, and I also uh, write for publications or I facilitate um, working with writers for publications on artists' work. And I 
feel like that's a really important contribution. Um, I think there's uh, a lot of write- or a lot of artists who can't write about their own work, but there's also more and more it's expected when you come out of art school as an artist that you should be able to, and um, that you're uh, certainly if you're doing your MFA, you do a lot of um, art theory, and you and you have to be able to write uh, quite critically about art. Um, so, in in my experience, I think um, it's it's an important thing for uh, for an interpret uh, for the interpreting for the viewer in the exhibition. But I also just think that um, it. It's expanding on the ideas of uh, what the artist is doing visually. So, again, like I don't think that there's a conflict there. That I think that writing, um, when it's done really well too, um, if if the writer's usually working with the artist, so there's a conversation that happens. Um, and the the best writers that I'm working with on publications, they'll do many interviews with the artist and. So there's there's the artist perspective, but then they can also offer something else. So I think that kind of writing, um, in the form of a book that exists after an exhibition, is really important. But also, as the interpreter of the work that you're seeing in the exhibition, which you can decide to look at or not. But in my role, certainly, I feel like those labels are important. And I I think you're right, Charo. As art historians, we've all used exhibition catalogs. If we haven't. It's too bad. So you do fulfill, and you didn't mention, you do a lot of media work, too, on uh, television, which is also another way of communicating ideas about exhibitions. And uh, yeah. So does anyone else? Uh, Brad? One comment on that and on yours, when you talk about the, is this on? the consciousness of the, the creator and the consciousness of the receiver, and does it matter what medium? Each medium has its potentials and its limitations. And words have, they're able to express certain clarities and certain distinctions that other mediums may not. That doesn't mean it's superior to sculpture or to music or any other kind of medium, but it does something different. Um, And that's maybe a reason why you have these interpretations. Whether an artist feels it's necessary is another question. Can I respond to? Oh, go, um, go ahead. just just sec. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was I was just going to add. Um, there's an interesting term that's uh, that's used uh, by the social sciences and the humanities research council, which is one of our funding bodies uh, for uh, various uh, scholarly activities, which is research creation, and uh, and it's the um, I'm not going to get the exact definition of this correct, but it, it's the concept that uh, the creative process is uh, actually a form of research and the creation of a work of art uh, contains the thought processes of the uh, scholar. And uh, I think that's something that, that Jeffrey's insisting on uh, in the work, that the work itself is the product of that thought process and the writing is the reflection on some of the some of the things not all of them some of the things that have come out of the the work uh, so uh, and it seems to be a little bit um, it's something that that we haven't fully talked about uh, is the relationship of that process uh, as a as a scholarly activity or, or as a as a research uh, a mode of research well add to it if uh, you feel it should be expanded no I just wanted to put that out there because that's yeah. so much yeah like, that could be a yeah. form I've seen that <laughs> term yeah yes Sergey. Uh, Sergey Petrov I just would like to come back to what Linda said about writings of Paul Gauguin which actually make his work uh, seem to be more complex. Uh, to me, I think it's probably the way it should be because making an analogy with science, science loves dealing with infinities. It can take infinite numbers, infinite universe, and reduce them to a very neat formulas which can fit on a quarter size paper. 
Art is the opposite. It's a finite objects, whether it's a book, piece of music, or a sculpture. And yet, when it's infinite possibilities of perception. So by supplementing his work with his writings, Gauguin, at least to me, what he indicated that it would be wrong seeking a simple explanation, simple understandings, rather that it's, it's an invitation, more like an invitation to infinity. I'm afraid um, a lot of the audience today, especially popular audiences, when they uh, read uh, materials written by art critics, the expectation is that there would be simple formulas which somehow make the understanding of art very easy and trivial. So I, again, coming back to it, I think that's the way it should be, uh, is that um, it shouldn't be an explanation, but perhaps just an indication how complex it really is. So if I read something about art, I want it to be going outward rather than coming to a point. Well, that's a, that's a nice analogy between art and the science. Although I imagine some scientists would tell you uh, that in um, reducing something to half a page, that it could have been more. Are there other ways of looking at it? Or, you know, um, certainly in discussions with Linda's father, who's a physicist, um, he's often talked about that, 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 you know, you can't sort of pinpoint it. But, you know, I think for purposes of the, the, um, the forum, it's, it's a good observation. Yeah. And I agree, should go out the conversation. Can anyone build on that, yeah. Jeffrey? Yeah. Peter mentioned uh, the difference between analogy and metaphor, which I, I talk about. Um, one of the keys to truth by analogy is that they're repetitive. You can repeat them. And so as you come up with that formula to the point, when you bring it down to the point, it's because you actually have something that can be repeated. That's success in science. There's the fact that it can be observed over and over and over again. On the other hand, the metaphor opens this way. The more you study the metaphor, the more it become, you become lost outside of the, the parameters of your own mind. And so that, I think, also is, is dead on at that point. And using those two aspects of, of writing, the analogy and the metaphor, uh, to apply to that, to, to apply to what you're saying. Yeah, this is an excellent way uh, to put what I was just trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think um, what I have found with artists' writings is that very often the way that they are used by art historians is in looking for an explanation for the work of art, and it's a very difficult thing to resist doing that um, because I think Marcus was saying if you're, if you're working on an artist who is alive to come up with an explanation other than what they have said about their work is, is challenging um, and yet often when artists are writing they are doing something which is in itself creative rather than being an explanation of what they've done in a visual form uh, or they might be writing that there might be particular motivations behind their writing. In Gauguin's case, the motivation seems to be precisely to kind of put people off the course in a way. So that I don't think we can use artists' writings ever as some kind of simple way of explaining what it is that they've, they've done in their practice. But I do find that quite often that is how they're used. That we find bi sources of biographical information, which we assume are true. Um, we find accounts of what the significance of the subject of the work might be or the processes which might be um, based on unreliable memories or, or might be deliberately uh, written up that way. So I think that we just have to be very careful of how we treat them as documents. I was wondering if any, do any of the students have uh, experience in terms of, I know some of you are not visual artists, some of you are writers and I just wanted to invite the students' uh, perspectives as well, if there's any um, you know, on on the subject, because I think we haven't heard that yet today. But even you don't have to feel like you, you know, 
have to make an earth-shattering contribution, but we certainly like to hear, you know, you're, you're currently engaged in uh, the art education process, and it's been a long time, since 2011, since we've had a group, a, a larger group of students. So, you know, any impressions would be welcome. Um, my name's Annabelle. I'm in the writing department. And um, it's interesting to observe, like, as a young writer, there's a huge cult of personality, and you have to create, or you're encouraged to sell yourself. Like, I'm encouraged even at this stage, I feel a long way away from launching a career, to have a tagline, what am I writing about, who am I, where's the selling point? And I feel like what Linda was saying about contemporary artists, the pressure on them to create a verbal tagline it's really interesting. Like, I, there's so few exhibitions that I go to see now where the artist hasn't written a statement or it's not even implicit in the work. Like, sometimes it's literally on the wall. Um, and I find Jeffrey's writing quite interesting because it's not doing that. And I would be quite interested to know where you think that fits in because I feel like what a lot of um, contemporary visual artists are required to do is something very different from those historical writings. It's a very specifically market-oriented thing. Excellent. Um, one thing I, we haven't talked about is the two arms of commodification. One, one is obviously the marketplace, and the other one is a, a more interesting one that's developed s since the Second World War, and that's uh, um, cultural and political commodification. And that's done on a very separate level. Uh, I think it really grew out of the idea of the European common market and how they would finally be amalgamated under one currency, should they ever have it, which they do now. Um, but this is back in 1951, 52, when the, 53, when the idea of a European common market came about. So there's a second commodification that's really taken over a lot of art, and that's the socio and political aspect of commodification. And it's the national sort of aspiration to maintain a culture in a certain way. I noticed that a lot of that writing work that comes that you're talking about, that's amalgamated and hung on the wall, usually comes from that side of the commodification. Um, it, it's a way of satisfying that national statement of aspiration. In Canada, it was essentially, the Canada Council really grew in, in the, the mid-1960s when uh, there was a, a very strong Quebec separation movement. And the way of buying it off, co-opting it, was really just throwing a lot of money at it, which it did quite successfully. Mm -hmm. By 1976, when the, uh, when the first uh, referendum was held, they lost that referendum probably because the Canada Council threw so much money that way. The rest of Canada, they just salted it down. But I noticed when I went to New York, and, and Americans really had contempt for, for the, the Canada Council, and they certainly had contempt for the 49th parallel. Uh, that's where I really saw a lot of that work on the wall. It was, coming out of the, it was coming out of the Canada Council and the 49th parallel. That was the secondary of commodification. Now, the United States did it in spades in 1967 when they did the, uh, when they did the uh, um, Expo 67. You know, my, my age of students were out marching at that particular point. And so it became very clearly propaganda. And the artists really loaned themselves to that propaganda in the American pavilion. Now, the case for this other and second commodification really needs, it really needs to be looked at because it is very, very similar in, in, in terms of the commodification to the market. That looking for that alternative market has actually become a commodification in and of itself. So that there is a certain path, there's a certain pathway to actually gaining recognition within that second path of commodification. There's a certain way of dealing with art bureaucracies and certain ways of doing it, getting into the... And, and where you really see it are in the Biennales, and that was really clear in the 1960s. So that overlap of work 
seems to be something that grew out of that particular area. And I, I, I think that it's really, my exposure to it is, is that it comes out of the statement of the alternate avant-garde, and that av alternate avant-garde tends to be government uh, government uh, government funded and, and so it's another form of marketing and so you're right when you call it a form of marketing and it tries to cross over into the to the art market itself and sometimes succeeds but it really comes from another area of commodification and that's the hidden area of commodification it's kind of absurd but there is definitely a state-supported avant-garde all over, and, it, and there's a state-supported avant-garde in Germany that just won't quit it, ever since, you know, it's just really put it out so that you actually had state-supported anarchism by the, the, late, uh, the late Cold War. And, and, and that usually involved words. Why? Because it was engaged in propaganda which is really interesting. So it's, it's a different form of propaganda, but it's the propaganda that, that really was stated in that American pavilion. We, we stand for freedom. And almost always, it always says that. That's always the thing that, that is the underlying aspect of that Cold War uh, socio-political commodification. I don't know if that yeah. means anything to you or not. Well, Sergio Beau's book on the, um, uh, the Quebec modernists and, uh, certainly deals with how um, abstract expressionism in New York was used by uh, the CIA. I think we all know that. And so these are, these are issues worth thinking about. And um, Annabelle, do you want to respond to Jeffrey's remarks? Or, uh? I mean, that's like... That's not something I've thought about deeply, so it's interesting to hear. I don't know if anybody else wants to contribute. Yeah. Well, a, a counter voice to Serge Gilbeau is uh, David Craven, who wrote a wonderful book on abstract expressionism mm -hmm. uh, with documentation of the CIA and other agencies mm -hmm. spying on the abstract expressionists, mm -hmm. being very concerned about the dissident politics of those people. And... Um, and so David Craven uh, revisited this easy narrative of co-optation and complicated it in ways that I found meaningful. And I incorporate them into my classes. So, um, Yeah, uh, the issue of commodification, dissidence, um, different modes of, of um, co-optation, I guess I'd call it for want of a better way, uh, related to state power. Uh, have you, did you ever read uh, George Woodcock's Strange Bedfellows on the Canada Council? You know, an anarchist uh, critique of uh, state sponsorship and how it can sully things? Yeah. I, I recommend it. Yeah, and, and it has a particular punch, uh, that book, because uh, George Woodcock was not... Uh, um, he wasn't well-heeled, and so he was, uh, he was taking chances. And, uh, you yeah. know... Good, good, good point. Could I take up we this should. point of, about mm. how far then the achievement of an artist may be compromised by his or her own intentions and take that back to uh, Jeffrey's aphorism that art is an act of will in accord with a mature conscious. Is that a statement that it is so necessarily? Or is it a statement that it ought to be so? Ah. Uh, yeah, that's a value judgment. <laughs> so I would have to say that you probably were right in using the word ought. But then that's a value judgment. And artists have to do that all the time. So they do it. What I wanted them to be, what I wanted was uh, what an artist does within himself to describe that particular reality. So what the artist ought is not something that comes externally. It's something that has to come internally. And only the artist knows whether or not the art entered, and only the artist knows whether or not they've accomplished it. And I've, as I said, I've seen too many works where it never entered and it never finished. And that's especially true of a lot of 1950s art, where the genius had to be in the spontaneous aspect of where you began and how you finished that particular work. And a lot of work was unfinished, and a lot of it sits on, sat on racks. And when the artist died, 
in came the collectors, or in came the, the dealers, and started selling work that the artists themselves had withheld. They should have destroyed it. They should have known that if they couldn't have completed it in the instant that they had to complete it, that they were self-defeating at that point anyway. But the painting that most concerned me about this particular aspect of it is the night watch. I actually, it actually brings me to tears when I see how much Rembrandt hated that painting. He just absolutely hated having to do it. He was bankrupt, and here he was building up these burgers. And it's considered by many a great painting, and I look at it as one of the saddest paintings I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Which I think brings up an interesting point about commodification. Um, you know, whether, the, whether it's work that is made with the intentionality of fur market, um, or whether it's work that's created independently and then finds a market after the fact. I think those are two different things. Um, and furthermore, I think that the commodification of art uh, within the capitalist system, you know, it, it's also, um, of course, we're in hyper-capitalism now, and that's changing art, but I think there's a period in which uh, the commodification of art frees artists from uh, the guild system from being sort of slaves to religion and, and state sponsored uh, and, and also to a certain extent um, frees them from uh, patronage um, mm -hmm. because they're, they're, they're spreading out their, uh, their income over a larger swath mm -hmm. of, of people and uh, I think it allows to a certain degree uh, allowed um, contemporary art to uh, and the ideas within contemporary art to uh, expand at, at a very great, great pace. I, I want to comment on something, because there's someone here who can actually comment on this question of capitalism and art and, and, and the, the essence of freedom on non-capitalist society, and that's that man over there. <laughs> I'd like to hear his comment okay, on that. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, there was a several thoughts <laughs> comes to mind. Um, first of all, uh, being an artist in the Soviet Union, and uh, I defined it a very specific period. I'm not talking about 20s and 30s, where the Russian avant-garde suddenly found themselves in a communist Russia and eventually was exterminated. I'm talking about 30s, 40s, and 50s, you know, the Soviet state at its best. And an artist in that period had basically three choices. Well, four choices, just drink himself to oblivion. But, <laughs> but the first choice would be to join the official union and create propaganda as it was required and get all the necessary privileges. And that wasn't as easy to do as it may seem because many wanted to do it. So that was a social process, social selection, and the ones who were the best at it succeeded. The second option was um, to try to follow all of your moral consciousness and a gut reaction was to fight the regime. And for an artist, it would be naturally to fight it through art. Uh, it didn't happen very often in, until 70s and 60s because it was simply impossible. But in 70s, it was um, a burning question for many of the artists I knew in Russia. Well, we should protest because we hate the regime. We are artists. We should use our art as a protest. And very few actually realized that this is a kind of a game that it's not important to win. It's important not to participate. That by becoming the enemy of the state, you are still part of the state. By fighting what you hate through your art, you're actually supporting it. Because a totalitarian state needs its enemies as much as it needs its subjects. So the only way to truly fight it is basically saying it's not even worth fighting with and walk away and create a pure art. It was easier to do for my friends musicians because music is more abstract. But there have been a few artists in Russia at that time uh, who with a great difficulty finally realized that. And now looking back at that period, we can realize that whether it was a Soviet official art or a Russian avant-garde with a lot of anti-Soviet themes is pretty much forgotten because 
the whole state is gone, and only those masterpieces which were created regardless of a state, regardless of the Soviet culture, they survived. And they seem to be more in line um, with artistic lineage. In a way, I think for those art, few artists to stay within artistic lineage and tradition and ignoring the Soviet state, it was much more of a statement than any anti-Soviet propaganda. I also would like to say that um, in late Soviet state, there was um, commodification of art worked to a benefit of the artists in a very bizarre way. For example, even among the members of the official painters union, to gain a free uh, artistic freedom, they would paint a girl in a field which had absolutely no political statement. But they would call it as a young Komsomol member on the way to school <laughs> by commodifying it, and that gave them a freedom to include it in the official exhibits. <laughs> and uh, it was ingenious, but that was, I call, the, the reverse commodification when it actually worked for freedom. <laughs> Sergey, I'd like you to, to address, when I, when I was working in the Kostakis collection in Moscow in the late 1960s, uh, artists would come in all the time with their work, selling it to, hoping that Kostakis would sell it. And he did. He sold it to people at the, the embassies, to uh, visitors. So there was a kind of internal market, and you must know about that. Well, absolutely, and that market, again, was supported by a um, foreign community, journalists and diplomats or businessmen who were in Moscow. The market, uh, one, uh, they were basically looking for the way, foreigners were looking for the ways to buy cheap art, more like a souvenirs. Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, a commodification as we see right now, but it supported the artist. Yeah, if uh, regarding the pure artists in Russia at the time, I would like to share with you a very short story about somebody I knew who lived in a tiny apartment in Moscow. Uh, he had a canvas on the easel next to his bed, which was blank. Every morning he would get up and paint on that canvas using water. And water would darken the canvas, the priming, and that created the relief. And he didn't paint any abstract work. He actually painted realistic still lives, portraits. People would sit for him, and he, that's how he worked, because for him it was important just to study. And his technique actually perfected, and I was watching him. Certain areas would start to dry up, certain areas would darken, and it, the painting would be alive. But then, of course, everything would be dry, and the next morning he can start fresh. So I asked him, you know, why wouldn't he record it? Why wouldn't he take photographs of it? And he gave me a look, and I went and asked him again. It was creating art as objects was absolutely irrelevant for him. The only thing which mattered was what was going in his head while he was painting. For him, it was a source of knowledge of his, of his own mind. Everything else was just a byproduct. Well, on that note, I think we'll all have some coffee. <laughs>